Good morning to everyone, except people that did not draft Andrew Luck in the Scott Fish Bowl last year. <laughs> it is Monday morning, so we are diving back into the series that is behind the business of fantasy football. We've had uh, phenomenal guests on here, and we have another one coming on, as you can see. It is Scott Fish, and this is a series where we talk about everything that's going on behind the scenes. We peel back the curtains a little bit. We talk about the marketing, the business, the social, the engagement. So Scott was obviously a no-brainer to come on as a uh, as one of the guests for this series. He has so much going on. And to be honest with you, I'm usually very particular with the guests I pick. And I, I get a very wide variety of, of people because I think they can give a really wide kind of lens angle of different innovations that are going on within the industry. And Scott, when I started doing my research for you, as I tweeted at you yesterday, I didn't even know where to begin because I guess my lack of knowledge, I didn't I didn't know how long you had been in the game for. I didn't know how many things you really had your hand in. I didn't know, you know, what you've been involved in up to this point. It's a massive, massive amount of things within the fantasy space and you've helped to innovate and really push it forward. So if like the audience is even, you know, a quarter as excited as I am to talk to you about some of the stuff that you have going on and what you've been able to do within the industry, then this is going to be an extremely extremely valuable conversation show scott uh welcome to behind the business of fantasy football man thanks a ton man that's it's awesome to be invited on this show you've uh, you've had a, a lot of awesome guests with a lot of awesome knowledge to share uh behind the business which is it's the most fun stuff to talk about for me honestly it's really interesting to hear how people go about uh their marketing, their branding, their, you know, what made them what they are today in the industry. I, I love every bit about this show. I'm, I'm glad you put, you've put it out there for the last couple of years. Yeah. And, you know, when I first dove in and I was like, when I try to you know, introduce the, the person on the opposite end of the mic, you know, I try to give who they are, the, the, the job title and whatever. And when I sent the show sheet over originally to you, I was like, yeah, so you're, you know, a full-time writer for XYZ. And you're like, no, I actually don't do that any there anymore. You probably read like a, a past history bio that needs to be changed <laughs> or something right now. So at, at this very moment, you run a company called Safe Leagues, correct? Correct. It's a, it's a commissioner service. Basically, I run legal fantasy contests. I run mostly season-long contests. Uh, you know, your basically basic season-long leagues, redraft and dynasty, that kind of stuff. So I'm constantly day in, day out, dealing with the, the business side of that, the uh, compliance, all the, st the state regulations and licensing that is happening every single year. More and more states are wanting to uh, regulate fantasy. So that's the kind of stuff I have to keep my keep my eyes on and and whatnot that's that's the main part of my job right now okay very cool yeah I'm, i want to dive in really deep on that later because i've personally had some experience in a way trying to set up something in which you've already successfully done logistically and i didn't even really know you were doing this up until you know recently when i when i just started diving into uh, what you've been up to so i'm excited to get into that but let's rewind a little bit and let's do a yeah. little bit let's take them down history lane here <laughs> and i mean you started in the fantasy industry so long ago. And from what I've gathered, you came into the industry for a little while. You eventually started your own site, which I believe was called FF Oasis. And yep. you were one of the only people covering, you were basically credited with creating Devi, right? And right. and Devi, for people out there that don't know what that is, is for the most part, I'm not actually even sure, that sure because I don't personally play, <laughs> but it's it's mixing college prospects in with your actual fantasy leagues, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I, I guess to, to take the story back even further before I started my fantasy career, I started playing uh, fantasy football in 1992 and my first ever league was a dynasty league because that's I didn't know there was any other way to do it my dad had this big 10 basketball league where they drafted college freshmen and they kept them throughout their college career so I I never knew that there was this redraft thing I just we drafted a fantasy football league and we just kept them throughout their career so I that's where I started and so in 1998, 99, I wanted to add Debbie player or college players, be able to draft those as well. And once they got to the pros, you know, kind of, kind of along the lines of my dad's league, once they got to the pros, I got to keep them forever. So we started drafting college players. A few years later, I went online to see if this is being done anywhere. I went on message boards and those aim chat rooms and all the, all the stuff. That it's was so boring. funny that everyone that anyone that like is a content creator or like has been successful in any sort of content creation, even outside of fantasy, the beginning of everything always starts in some weird chat rooms or forums. Like no matter yeah. where you come from, it's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Though. No, that's how it, it's true, though. You, you go trying to search out, find if uh, anyone else is doing it, or the brainstorm came in that, that chat room or that message board, and I couldn't find anyone doing it. And uh, so I became a part of that message board community called Fantasy Football Cafe, and they pegged me to start doing their start sits, their, their start sit article, their, you know, waiver wire article, stuff like that. 
couple of years later, I ventured on my own, started my own website called FF Oasis. And we did Debbie, which is, you know, drafting of college players before they get to the pros. We did IDP and we did this, this fresh new thing called PPR that we didn't invent, but we were basically the only ones on the internet focusing with on those three things in like 2006, 2007. So when those three things, which are growing at that point, like you search PPR, anything on Google, the IDP, anything, Davi, anything. We were like top three Google search. We were first page right at the top above the fold. So I remember the days of growing a website from like 1900 page views in a month till you get to the month of August. And you know, in this content industry, Ooh, August, is. Yeah. <laughs> we got up to, I can't remember if it was our first year or second year, it's probably our second year. We got up to 286,000 page views in a month. Sorry, not 286, 826. I flipped the numbers there for a second. 826,000 page views in a single month. And we just knew we had something with uh, those three things. And that goes to something you've talked about on this show a lot is, finding that niche thing that no one else is doing out there. It's so crazy to me. I want to, I want to talk about Debbie for a second. Even in today's world, if you're trying to watch film on a player who's not necessarily in a power five conference, it, it looks like it's high school film. I can't yeah. imagine when you guys first started, like how could you possibly have been able to research these players with the technology that was at hand? Like that just seems so ridiculous that you were into that at that time. So yeah. forward thinking and so innovative and it's, it's crazy, but I want to know like, wh what were you thinking? Like how? I, I don't even know what we were thinking, honestly. <laughs> and all the videos were like that. And uh, I believe uh, Scout and, and places like that started in the early 2000s. So, you know, there are places you could get some information out there. A lot came from just watching on Saturdays. <laughs> and and uh, we made our way through it. Uh, watching the, in those early years, especially watching incoming freshmen, the, the high school tapes are just grainy as hell. There's they not, still are. Yeah, they still are. Very, yeah. very true. But yeah, that's, that's where I started. That's, that's how I got into the industry. And I've had, I've made a few pivots along the way, as I'm sure we'll get into. I told Scott before we started the show, I was like, I know you've done a million things, so we have to keep the history brief because on these shows, I try to get as much value out to the audience, as much like practical value out to the audience. So he touched on something that is, is, is so relevant in our industry because as more people break through and more people try to break through, it becomes so saturated and it is very, very saturated at this point. And that's going to be what happens with any market. As soon as people see opportunities, as soon as there's more money that comes in and as soon as there's people that are you know, passionate about a certain subject, it's eventually going to get extremely saturated. And the only way to stand out in a saturated marketplace is to start identifying you know, niches that are either very, very true to you or they are a gap inside the marketplace. And I mean, just, just talking to Scott right Great now. Great both happen at the same time. That's exactly. It, I mean, it was, it was a perfect storm, but in the same, in the same sense, it was just like, you had to put the work in, in order to make some of those things come to fruition, but like PPR, Devi, IDP, and we'll touch on this in a second. The, the commissioner podcast that you do with Ryan McDowell right now is yeah. another form of that. That's another way to, you know, let, let's, let's dive into that whole angle of creating a, a unique niche nowadays, because it's so hard because it seems like everything has been done. My point of view on that is creating a unique niche doesn't necessarily need to be, you don't have to create a brand new stat. Like you don't have to be the new Josh Hermsmeyer and, and tell people that running backs don't matter. You know, you don't have to be that. You don't have to create PPR as a template. It mm -hmm. can be like very, very simple things that separate you. And from a business standpoint, it could be like your, your marketing team. It could be your HR team. It could be like one or two different things that you do within your company or your brand that separates you. It doesn't have, I think people think of being unique as like black and white. They look at Matt Kelly and he's separated himself. One, of course, his advanced metrics on his site are great, but right. he's a polarizing figure. And that's something that separates him. But yep. when you're looking to separate yourself in the industry, it doesn't need to be based on your personality. I think whoever you are as a person will separate yourself in its own right, right? So when you, when you think about people coming up right now, what advice or like what opportunities do you think from any type of angle would be worth like pursuing from a unique standpoint? Man, that's a really, really good question. I think the, the best way I can answer that is probably that you do need to try to find something unique, whether it be a unique mentality or a unique way to play the game. There, there are still new varieties that get thrown out there daily and we're, we're not, we're not, we're definitely not done. You know, draft, yeah. uh, draft came out with their, well, MFL 10s even before that, they were first to market on that with uh, the best ball game and DFS just within the last five, six years, there are still play variations that are, are on the way. If anything with my, my data and research has told me anything, 
it's going to be things that not just are different than what's played right now, but it's, uh, it's going to be things that are simple that people can do quickly and from their phone. And I think that there are varieties people can investigate. And also when you see these new types, be first to market to, to jump in on uh, analyzing that and breaking down content for that. You see a lot of these XFL guys breaking down XFL things and starting to gain a following and stuff. That's going to open doors for them later, whether they love XFL or not. Maybe that opens a door for them later into doing something that they find more interesting. Jumping on some of these newer things that, that come out there, don't be afraid to uh, try your hand at them. Yeah, that, that's it right there. I feel like it's a great example with the XFL. People watching this might be like, ah, well, the XFL is not going to succeed. And that's fine. And there's a very good chance that that does happen in anyone that's creating content via XFL as their platform. It might come out to nothing. But the overall idea there is that you have to try your hands in these new things in order because if you want to succeed, like you do have to find this new unique avenue in order to do so. And you have to be willing to try everything, right? If you're not trying five or six things, you need one of those to hit. You know, you could fail on five or six of them, but if one of them hits, then there you go. You've gained your platform. You've gained your leverage. And the same way you said, like, you know, you might not be that passionate about XFL, but it gives you the leverage to do other things. And that's, you know, that's kind of the way I look at things too. I love talking about this kind of stuff. I love these conversations and I'm not, you know, I'm definitely not as passionate about like fantasy football per se as a lot of people that I see on Twitter, but that's what I've built my platform doing on YouTube is via fantasy football. But once I, you know, gain a big enough audience, I'll be able to pivot to things that I enjoy. And I think that's kind of the overall theme is like when you're inside the niche right there, like you could use XFL as a platform and you could use, you know, best ball is great. Like if you see best ball gaining traction, start creating content around best ball. When you see the new game that comes out next summer or whatever, start creating content around that. And you could yeah. be known as like the expert or, you know, the guy, the go-to guy in that niche. Cause it really doesn't take that much to, to become the go-to guy in a, in a new thing within fantasy football. Right. Yeah. And there's not, there's not a, a ton of people doing that XFL content right now. And, and mm -hmm. this is just, we're using this as an example right now, but when I, I, I no longer do my Sirius XM show, I, I'm got, maybe we'll have one, I'll have one again in the, in the future, but I, I did that for a two and a half years. And when something like XFL or AAF came up, we, I would go out and get those guys to come on my show. And all of a sudden they're increasing their brand name. They're increasing their name. They're, People know who they are from me bringing them on for that and me as a connection for them or my co-host or, you know, any other shows they go on. It's a new connection and bond they form just because they, they decided, you know what, I'm going to get really good at this, uh, this little niche thing here that's out there and maybe that leads to something down the road. Yeah. And one of the niche things that you do is you have the Commission Impossible podcast, right? The Commission podcast with Ryan McDowell. And I think this is another thing that falls right into this category that we're talking about in terms of like niching down and becoming the, the go-to guy or the expert in that particular niche within a field. Can you tell me like the background of this podcast, how long it's been going on and what was the actual, or you and Ryan just like, I love, you know, we love being commissioners yeah. of our league and we feel like we have a lot of like information and value to bring to people or, or is that like a, or is that kind of like an avenue to become the expert of the go-to and thus like feed the business that you run in safe leagues you know you, you might like you might like this a little more uh the way it, it actually came about ryan uh commissioned a ton of leagues and and got known for his commissioning he invented rules that people commonly play with today and, and i've done the same i've invented rules in dynasty that people commonly play with today that they don't realize me and Ryan created. <laughs> Dude, that's Ryan, what I'm saying. Like, as yeah. I was researching your stuff, it was just like credited with creating this and this and this. And I'm like, damn, yeah. Scott. You, you should see Ryan's list of credit. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Ryan got known for his commissioning. And because of Scott Fishbowl, you know, I think I was known at least decently for commissioning, but because of Scott Fishbowl, I was become known as this commissioner, the commissioner. And we decided to take that you know, value we have out there, people respecting and knowing us as commissioners. And we're like, let's make a podcast about commissioning and help other commissioners out there and use the, the equity we built as being known commissioners and make a podcast in this arena and make the, the podcast that people go for for commissioner information. That's a great mindset to have for a business, like being able to intertwine what you're known for, your value prop, putting it out there in form of content and just further cementing yourself as like an expert in that field. So that is, that is very cool. Uh, another like forward thinking thing of yours. And, you know, I was researching and I didn't realize that you ran Safe Leagues. So when you say you run Safe Leagues, you are right. like the owner of it? Well, so I have a parent company that's called Sports Hub Games Network. Underneath right. that parent company are things like League Safe. 
uh, they own League Safe. They own Fanball, which is a DFS company. They own NFFC and NFBC, which is National Fantasy Football uh, Championships, National Fantasy Baseball Championships, which are big, high stakes uh, companies. They own several companies under, they own Best Ball 10s and they own Safe Leagues. They own several companies underneath them. Uh, I am not the owner. They are the owner of the company, but I'm the, I'm what, the manager, the CEO. I, I run Safe Leagues. So it's yours, just not technically speaking, not Correct. legally speaking. Yep. Legally, okay. I, I do not have ownership. I'm the guy in charge of all the decisions and I run it and I, own, I don't own it though. <laughs> okay. I, w- I was going to say the more I like dove into you, the more I was like, how does this guy not run his, how has this guy never tried or how is he, how does he not run his own business at this point? You know, uh, I, I did that once and I would, I would bet good money that's going to happen, you know, sometime down the line. But for now, I enjoy I enjoy doing this, and I'm I'm enjoy being part of this uh, bigger company that they handle a lot of stuff that I don't have to deal with on the business side, at least for now. I hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's let's touch back on the Scott Fishbowl because this is you know as social media has been gaining this huge increase of people over the last few years, especially in the fantasy industry. Like Scott Fishbowl has been going on for a long time, but if you're semi new to Twitter, you'll see around June, July, the hashtag SFB and then whatever number it is. So for this previous year, it was the SFB nine, the Scott Fishbowl nine. Yep. Um, this was the first year that I participated in it. And for those of you guys that are, are uh, unfamiliar with it, it's this gigantic league that Scott puts together. And this year, I believe it was 1200 people, right? Yep. So 1200 participants in one fantasy football league they're split up into a hundred different, my math is correct, a hundred different 12 team leagues. Yep. And it's a mixture of basically every fantasy analyst that you guys follow out there that you follow on Twitter, you listen to podcasts or YouTube channel or whatever it is. They are in this league. It is, it is literally the pros versus Joe's league that he lets in a bunch of fans and everything. So it is like the go-to craziest league in the industry. And the popularity has grown exponentially over the last few years. And as you've been growing this, I imagine the work that you do behind the scenes is just a crazy, 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 crazy amount of work. My question to you is like, cause I see you tweet out sometimes, you know, and it's not like you're like complaining about it whatsoever. You're just like, Oh my God, like I have so much to do for this. <laughs> yeah. Like with the amount of popularity and the amount of, of money that, you know, you could bring in, why not outsource some of the labor or administrative work? Cause I'm sure there's like a thousand kids out there that would be like, Oh my God, I'd love to be doing administrative work for Scott Fish. And I know you don't want to charge for the league or whatever, but even yeah. if it was like 50 cents a participant, even like a quarter of a participant, that's like a thousand dollars of freelance outsource work. Have you ever thought about doing that? Yes, I have. Um, and th- this is something we're definitely going to get into uh, later, I'm sure. But I do not charge for Scott Fishbowl because it would be illegal. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. when, I, when you run that many leagues uh, and you have people in banned states and international people, right. okay. uh, it would draw attention to state compliance officers and state attorneys and they, they would shut me down very quick. I, I can tell you a fun story. A few years ago, probably five, six years ago, I tried to start doing this. I was going to run an international best ball championship. I wanted to like uh, run it just for the international people uh, who, you know, they, they have trouble entering contests a lot of times. I got an email within 48 hours. <laughs> from, <Jeez>. from, <laughs> okay. I mean, you cannot do that. <laughs> so um, once you charge money, once you charge an entry fee, and if, you, if you're visible enough, like I, I tend to be, especially on social media, you're going to get contacted pretty quickly. So I can't charge for SFB unless I want to start banning states and international people. So that's the problem there. I can accept donations. I can say, hey, you can donate if you'd like to, but I can't require it. I had Ryan McDowell help me last year and the year before, and he can tell you it's, it's an unreal amount of work. And I've set up some automation to make it easier. But uh, I think at some point, I probably will have to. At the current moment, I've just been able to manage it by myself. And I know Ryan and I, I trust us to be able to get it done. This year might be different though. We're we're planning some very big things, including live drafts in different cities all over the country. Guys like TJ Hernandez uh, wants to run one in Sa- in San Diego. Jamie Eisenberg from CBS wants to run one in Florida, have a live SFB draft. That kind of stuff I'm going to have to outsource. There, there will be some outsourcing, but for now, I'm hand- I'm okay handling the, you know, the, the back end stuff of it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, with 1200 people entering, I, I don't even, I, I get anxiety and, and stress just like thinking about the amount of work you have to do, but it's growing so quickly. The year before it was 900 people, right? Yeah. Yep. So this is, yeah. So this has grown massively like year over year, 912, 1200. How many, how many applicants did you get this previous year of the 1200 people that you let in? 10,000? Over 10,000. 
That's in, that's insane. So I want to touch on exclusivity. Now I yeah. feel like this is not part of like a business plan for you whatsoever, but well, I think it's been talked about it quite a bit though. Like, okay. Okay. How that's exclusive cool. do we make this exclusive to, you know, draw attention to it? Like this is something that like, you really want to get into or do we let everybody, we've had the, I, I've had these discussions. with people. Yeah. Cause I, I was going to ask, I mean, you look at, there are plenty of businesses that literally their model is based off of exclusivity. Like think about, Supreme, the clothing brand, right? The apparel brand. I'm not sure if you're like too familiar with it, but it's one of the more popular apparel companies in the world right now. And if you ever, if you're ever in like New York City and you see a giant line waiting outside a building, it's probably because Supreme just dropped like a new pair of shoes. They do like collabs with artists and things like that. And their clothing is very, very, very limited. So you buy some and someone will flip it on eBay for like eight times the amount. It's ridiculous. They just came out, they're doing a they're doing a collab with Oreo. So they're making an Oreo that's red with the Supreme logo on it. And they're selling it like a pack of three Oreos for like $60 a pop or something like that. And they're able to do that based solely on the business plan of being exclusive. I mean, their clothes aren't like that much better in terms of material. I'm sure it's a little bit better for the price that they offer, but exclusivity is another way that you can do this. And I think like Scott Fishbowl obviously has all of the foundation of being able to drive off of that. So I did want to pick your mind on the whole backbone of this for you is, is now it seems like the, the main goal is to continue to increase charitable donations to mm -hmm. fantasy cares, which we'll right. touch on in a little bit, but it's a donation that you charity that you, that you're very, very strongly involved in it and care about a lot. It's kind of like two ends of the spectrum. It's like, do you keep it exclusive to continue to make this like the number one go-to fantasy league within the entire industry? Or do you let as many people as you possibly can, because uh, you know the more people you let in, the more work is obviously there for you on the back end in order to up the donation level. So yeah, let, let me let me hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so I have increased it every year. It's been more just workload. The the amount I can I feel like I can comfortably handle it, me and Ryan recently, but feel I can comfortably handle. I've thought at many points each year of not increasing it just to maintain that exclusivity because when people join, especially the non-analysts, they want to play with the Jamie Eisenbergs, the Adam Ranks, the Matthew Berries, the all these all every big name analyst in the industry plays in this thing. Right. And they want to play with them. And if it was like five hundred leagues your shot at playing with Matthew Barry is like now almost nothing, right? So the draw becomes less and less. So I don't think I'm going to keep growing it that much more, if at all. I have, I have big plans for this year because this is SFBX. This is the 10-year anniversary. But um, I think I'm going to stick a little closer to that exclusivity part in that I, I just don't want to grow it a whole lot more off of what it's already done. And I'll have satellites for people to try to get in as I do every year. But it's the kind of thing that I feel like those donations can come in other ways. Why not keep this event like the main huge attraction it is? Make it this make it this thing where it currently is, where when people get that invite, they are excited as hell. And people just they tweet out about it and they like have videos of them just excited and it makes their day that they get it. And if it's if it's a ten thousand man tournament and basically everyone gets in. I don't know that happens anymore. So I, I want to keep it this really exciting thing that's special to get into. So I think I'm probably nearing max capacity or very close to max capacity on the main event part of that. And I, I can find other avenues to, to get donations for charities or to help people realize that you should, you should bring purpose into fantasy football. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna be you're gonna be flirting with like Harvard level of acceptance rate soon. I mean, if there were if there were ten thousand this year, I mean, it's insane when, especially when the draft kicks off or when you start uh, initially sending out the invites for the Scott Fish Bowl. Yeah, it on Twitter, like you see nothing on the timeline other than that, and yeah. it's taken on a mind of its own. And as Twitter keeps growing and as the industry keeps growing, I'd be really surprised if you didn't get twenty thousand applications this year. Did you already open up applications for the next one? I did, and we're already up to five thousand. <laughs> Jesus Christ! And it's only and we're still good February. four months away. Yeah. Five okay. Away. Yeah. So you're probably gonna. It might be like twenty five, thirty. Yeah, I'd say sixty like percent of the the applications come within the month and a half before. So two months before. Jeez. And it it kicked off. What was it the last the first week of June or was it July? It's uh, always the Monday after July fourth. I don't know why it happened the first year, but it turned into this thing where it's the perfect dead time in the fantasy football era where, or area where, you know, training camp is still a couple weeks away. 
and nothing, just absolutely nothing is go- going on. The, the draft has been done for over a month. Everybody does their rookie drafts in May. Uh, so by July, there's just, it's a dead zone and it's just perfectly fit in there. They, they get the 4th of July partying done and then it's, it's SFB time. Yeah, my only problem, if you couldn't tell from the very first line of this entire interview, is that I ended up with Andrew Luck, you yeah. know, in the third round. So I wish it could be pushed back a little bit, like later into yes. August, so we know, uh, you know, what's going on realistically. But that makes sense given everything that goes on. I feel like in August it might lose a little bit of steam because everyone has their own personal drafts and there's so exactly. much content being pushed out at that time. That was so, a big part of it too. Is all these industry analysts and content providers, uh, content you know, content people. I didn't want to throw a draft in the middle of August when there's all this other stuff that everybody has to work on. No, that that totally makes sense. That's just a subjective thing that that I'm personally <laughs> mad about. But but everyone who did good in the Scott Fishbowl, I'm sure is perfectly happy with, yeah. with when it launches random question do you ever listen do you know who gary v is gary vaynerchuk i i do and i've heard you mention him on the show i haven't listened to his stuff but uh you and you've talked about him at least twice i i listened to joe holka one yesterday and i'm like i need to check this guy out oh i i, I listen to gary v religiously pro, uh, once a day if not like multiple times a day depending on how many pieces of content he puts out um yeah he has this really interesting theory that i want to get your thoughts on he calls it the high school party theory take yourself back to your high school days and you know, there's, there's people that are cool. There's people that are not so cool. There's people that are in the middle and there's usually one or two people, you know, in your graduating class that they had those, those parents, right. That either were out of town all the time, or they were like, you know, if you're going to party, you might as well do it with a parent that is there and making sure that you guys are like, okay, in the process of it. So that person would throw the parties for everybody else in that high school class for the most part, right. They were, they were like the party house, they had the party parents or whatever. So within doing that, if they were at like this level of cool, right? They were like kind of cool, kind of hung out with the cool kids. Maybe not. They had their own group or whatever. Once they started throwing the parties, they got some more clout within their, within their graduating class, right? They started becoming cool because they started associating with all the people that wanted to party. And that's just how high school works for better or worse, right? So he has this theory that like, for podcasting, if you start surrounding yourself, it's almost like you you host the party, right? It's almost like, you know, I it's almost like what I'm doing right now. It's it was a subconscious thing. This was definitely not part of the plan here. The main value thing I'm getting at is like for people that are new to podcasting, what are some strategies, you know, to start growing within the niche and start getting yourself associated with bigger networks in order to expand your audience? So like what I'm doing here is when I started this this interview series, my audience was was much was much lower than it is now. But like Andy Holloway came on for the first episode, right? And right. since then I've been able to like associate my name with him. So the next person I tried to get on to my list, I'd be like, Yeah, Andy just came on. We had a great interview. They see Andy and they associate yeah. it and they're just like, Oh, if Andy gave him like the cosign, then you know, why why wouldn't I do it or whatever? So that kind of gets the ball rolling so his high school party theory is like you know if you host the party that will automatically bring your coolness level up a little bit you know and I think I think it's like a really really good analogy within like content creation so people you know we do see it a lot like a lot of podcasting and videos nowadays is just like bring someone on interview them bring someone on interview them and it does get a little like cliche and it does get a little bit boring if you don't have your own personal style and your own twist to bring into the content itself but I'm curious as to your thoughts like one on, on the theory itself but two like other tips for people kind of getting started with podcasting. I know we talked about like being unique and finding a unique niche, but um, the overall theory just like really clicked with me. And I was like, that's a really like interesting way to think about it. That's literally the description of how SFB became what it was, right? That's why I, I figured that would resonate with you a little bit, but you've done so much to get your, you get your name out there that SFB wasn't like the thing that jump started you. It probably got you to the point where like, random household people that just like kind of follow people on Twitter definitely know you now to like a a bigger scale, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. In fact, I I was talking to Matt Harmon about this. uh, What was it? Two years ago at one of the FSGA events or FSTA at the time. And he said one of his buddies uh, contacted him. He's like, you got to get in this fishbowl thing. Then you made it. (laughs) And I'm like, and Matt Harmon was at NFL.com at the time. And he had a buddy telling him to get in my league, which is It's so, such a weird thing, but no, that's exactly how Fishbowl became what it is today. And uh, in 2010, when it started, I, I did not have that kind of uh, weight in the industry. And uh, Mike Clay came into the league. Mike Clay from, uh, you know, he was at the time, I believe, either PFF or he might have been, even been pre-PFF. But I'm going to guess he was at PFF. And Jeff Hasley from Football Guys. And like, I, I got industry guys to play in this little 
60 to 96 team league those first two years. And Mike Clay actually won it year one, which is also a, just a huge boost to be able to be like, this is the league Mike Clay won last year. And people are like, Mike Clay was in it last year. And every single analyst that joins up each year that maybe didn't the year before, people see that name, oh, they're playing, I'll play too. What the heck? Um, and that's – so that, that theory doesn't just resonate. Like it, it seems completely 100% accurate. Like that's how you're, you're talking about your show. This show has grown. It's the same week with SFB every year, more and more analysts play because they say, see who played last year. And they're, they're like, why should I should be doing this too? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely valid. And I, I, yeah, it, it really resonates. Did you, did you simul? Sorry. I did listen to that whole thing you just said, yeah, but did, yeah. you, did you simultaneously switch your background to a green screen while you were talking? I did not. It, it's just my it's just my wall in the background. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I could have sworn because it got gray for a second, and I was like, "Wait." Did he I might like, have uh, adjusted my. Don't worry about. It. I don't even know why I brought it up. During <laughs> that. But yeah, yeah, that, that's why. Like I, I, like I can relate to that. And then I was thinking about it. I was like, "Yo, Scott could definitely relate to that too." In the sense that the, yeah. the fishbowl has grown in so much popularity, but now, like you've, you know, you've overtaken the fishbowl to where, like, you as a person and what you're doing within the industry is is more known than what the what the SFB does in itself. You know, and yeah. I think it's it's an interesting, a very interesting path. And we're just trying to give ways or outlets for people to try to break break through. And I, it's very tough to get on shows with with people that have a bigger audience, right? Like you have to be able to deliver a value prop on the other side of things. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious, like I see your thoughts, say you're a newcomer trying to get someone onto your show or trying to interview someone or trying to get associated with them in any way, shape or form. Like, do you think it's impossible to do so just no. with, without an audience, without leverage? Like, what do you, what Absolutely would your suggestion not. be? I mean, I, I'm sure you've talked to several of these guys and I don't know your conversations outside of the show and maybe it's come up on the show before, but I have said yes to go on podcasts where there's probably 17 listeners. Mm -hmm. Like th there are a lot of really nice people in this industry that will go on your show and it's, that they'll give you 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. Uh, and all you have to do is ask uh, I it's, <laughs> I think too many people are re just worried about someone being mean or something and, or rejecting them or just not answering them, which does happen because sometimes yeah. the timeline gets flooded, but uh, I'd say a good percentage of us uh, understand that doing all these shows and is a good thing. It, even if it's to 17 new people, it doesn't matter if it's just, if it's making a connection with someone who's got a podcast that gets 50 listeners or a hundred listeners or a thousand listeners, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's fun interacting with people who share the same passion as us. And, and more than that, maybe down the line, that's a podcast that has, I, I don't think this way when I do it, but you can, you can easily make the argument, the podcast that had 1000 followers or 1000 listeners when you did it, maybe they have 50,000 the next time they, that they ask you, you know? So it's yeah. a big part of this industry is building those relationships. So always ask, by the way, I did want to mention to you, what do you think of that Scott Fishbowl name on that, on that tournament? As far as marketing, I almost didn't call it that. <laughs> no, dude, it's phenomenal that it's, <laughs> you know what it is like Scott, if you told me that like Scott Fish wasn't your actual name, I'd believe yeah. it too. So I think it works in that sense. But if, if like I had created it and it was like the Nick Urkelano bowl, I'd be like, this guy's a douchebag. You know what I mean? Exactly. It, it works for you because the name is just smooth. I hate, I hated it when we did. So the site I ran was FF Oasis and the first two years, this was called the FF Oasis Invitational, but then I closed my doors and moved on to new, new opportunities. I needed a new name and Twitter came up with that. They came up with the fishbowl. So you hang and, it on that. You're like, Oh, Twitter did it. So I'm cool. Yes, with it. <laughs> yeah. And fishbowl.com, fishbowl.org, fishbowl, all those were taken. You're also like a really good dude. So it's like, there's no reason to get mad at you for having that name. If it was someone yeah. that, that was like widely not liked, then I'd be like, okay, maybe, right. maybe don't like associate. You're the person behind it. You know what I mean? But yeah. I, I like where it is. Though. You're like seven, eight years, six, seven years after changing it to Scott Fishbowl. I can say that having that name did a ton for branding though. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And I want to go back to you saying like most people will come on and most people will say yes to you. And that's very true. Like what I found within the fantasy yeah. industry is it, it's just people that are super passionate about creating and talking about the subject and stuff, which is a great hold to be in right now because most people will absolutely say yes. Like Andy had no business saying yes to coming on. And then after that, it was like James Coe, NFL Network, Brad Evans, Yahoo. And it was like these big names. And again, they had no, like they, I'm sure they had so many things on their plate to do. And I admittedly, I think a lesson here for me, right? Reaching out to some people and people reaching out to me. I am a little bit more particular now what I do with my time because I have a lot going on behind 
behind the scenes that I try to take care of. What I will say though, no matter the size of your podcast or the size of your YouTube channel, if when, you know, if you reach out to someone to try to get them on, you really need to put some thought and you really need to put some context behind it. Like if you're going to reach out to me, yo, Nick, come on my podcast next week. Let's, let's talk about fantasy. Like I'll, I'll probably brush that aside because it's not something that I won't see 10 times a week. But if you write out something that's contextually relevant to me as a person, right? Like something like, oh, like you've watched my piece of content. You made a joke about something I said with Scott or something. You're like, yo, I love this part of the interview. You know, I've been following you for X, Y, Z. Um, you're someone I look up to, like things like that, you know, like make it very relevant to the person, like bring a, not, not a value prop in a sense, but make sure that what you're saying is meaningful. And I think that goes a long way with communicating yeah. to the other person on the other side, especially if they're like at a, at a, a bit of a higher level than you are right now. Yeah, definitely. I I definitely agree with that. Especially knowing what's knowing what they want to have you on for is is always is always a plus. Any added information it makes it a lot. And it, when it, when it's something valuable like that, it makes it a harder no for, for the yes. for the guy you're asking to. <laughs> Yeah, the more information you, the more relevant information you yeah. provide, the easier it is. Because what happens is you send over something that's super general, and now it's more work on my plate. Like I have to figure out what is this even about? Like, what are we going to talk about? Who are you? X, Y, Z. So it's like, if you're going to reach out, it's like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I would love to talk to you about these particular subjects. Here's like my social links. If you want to go check them out. And this is what I've done so far, you know, things like that. Like the more contextual you can make it to the message, the much higher level of chances that you're going to have for people to, to say yes to that. So, Oh yeah, absolutely. We talked a lot about safe leagues and I, I want to dive into this. I want to give you a quick background on what I tried to do last year. I had the idea that I was like, you know, I have a pretty decent size season long audience within my audience. Right. So I'm like, I would love to be able to create the infrastructure for people to join leagues, right? The big dogs got to eat community for them to be able to play with each other. Maybe I'll hop in one or two of the leagues and we'd be able to play together. I wanted these to be paid leagues. I wanted them to be competitive. I wanted them to be like really, really good leagues, you know? And I was like, this is a really good long-term play. I think if I could set up the infrastructure on, uh, in in the beginning part of it. Mm -hmm. And what I found out really quickly, as you brought up is there's a lot of stuff a lot of technicalities and legal things that are that make it very very difficult. So I started reaching yeah. out to some of the players within the space, you know, companies like Flea Flicker and Sleeper and those guys and I got on calls with them. What I found out really quickly is there's no way to automate this. There was no at least for us without having some level of power within like the legal system, there's no there's no way to automate this if you want to do paid leagues. And what I was thinking was like, you know, how does Yahoo how does Yahoo have their pro leagues on their site? Like they have leagues in which you could go on there, join and, and pay. And they're just like, oh, they're just like very powerful and they know how to, you know, finagle their way into having those leagues. And I was like, okay, I, I don't know the, the technicalities behind it, but I'm sure they know whatever they're doing. So, you know, we set up like an infrastructure where Flea Flicker set up a bunch of big dogs got to eat leagues, like 20, 25, 30, whatever it was. I would say it to my audience, they would join the leagues and then we'd also have to put like manual instructions how to pay. And it just became, it, it got to the point where if you were going to scale it, it was, it was not doable, right? right? So I'm very interested in hearing like, how you do it at Safe League. So for the company that we used for the payments was, um, was TeamStake. So they're probably a direct competitor with you guys in, in terms of uh, League Safe, right? So, yep. so Safe Leagues, just so people aren't confused, Safe Leagues is basically like, if you're looking at for my audience, it's like the big dogs got to eat leagues, safe leagues. And League Safe is the actual software that you use to yeah. collect League money. Safe is its own, I know, its own company where you can, yeah, make payments to a league, pay into a league and have your league on there. It's a way to make sure your money's secure in, in case you don't know the commissioner too well, et cetera. And it just makes it easy to pay out. Team Stake does a, a very similar thing I, it, from what I've hear, heard. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So the whole goal behind it was just like, I want, I want to be like, guys, if you want to join a league, just click the link down below. They click the link and they have a a bevy of leagues. They join, they right from the homepage, they could pay their payments and everything. And I was like, that's way harder that that, that I just can't do it. There's no way I could automate that process. Unfortunately right now, because they have too many legal things going on. Like you said, you're in a state that doesn't allow you to play fantasy games or whatever. Like that's not going to happen. So it was just so much going on that I couldn't manually figure it out. So I'm I'm curious if if you want to open up about kind of like 
the way that you manually, since you run it, like I'm sure you have some kind of systems in place in order yep. to successfully make this happen. Sure. Uh, the first thing I'll touch on is uh, the biggest thing that they don't have and Team Steak wouldn't have and League Safe doesn't even have. Um, it, uh, I need to I need to start here when it comes to anyone talking about doing paid leagues because there are legal commissioner services out there like FFPC and like NFFC and like what I do and there's there's several legal ones there's several illegal ones uh, that don't do everything <laughs> absolutely legally and uh, are you on the, do you remember Phenoms have you heard of that. I don't think so, so that was a commissioner service that basically uh, got in trouble, got went under, wasn't able to pay everybody out, and just took everybody's money. Jeez. Yeah, and they were in a, they were an illegal commissioner service, and and those exist out there. And one of the easiest ways to tell when when there's an illegal one is legal commissioner services to legally run leagues like uh, like you're discussing, like I do. You need to geolocate, which is and, and generally identity verification as well, which means when they enter the contest, when they make the payment it runs through to locate exactly where they are in the, in the country. Right. Um, because what matters, maybe this is another step back, but what matters when you enter a contest legally is much like Vegas, much like betting in Vegas. I can bet on the Minnesota Vikings in Vegas. I can't bet on, on them in Minnesota, even though I'm a Minnesota resident. So when I'm in Vegas, I can bet on them. Fantasy contests are very similar. It matters where you're phys physically located when you make the bet. So you can't simply put in, I live in Minnesota, it should be legal, but you're standing in Arizona, that won't work. That's, it's illegal to enter a contest from Arizona. So you need geolocation, and that costs money to implement. <laughs> you have to implement that into, into whatever system you use, uh, whether it be you know, something prior to making the – prior or right after to making that team stake or league safe payment or whatever – and my parent company has done that for me, so I don't have to worry about it. You need geolocation, and you need to identity verify the person to make sure they are who they say they are. All states require that geolocation. They have to make sure you're not in a banned state. Um, so that's the big first stumbling block. Then when it comes to running safe leagues in general, I use my fantasy league for all my leagues, and they have an open API, which allows me to code a bunch of a bunch of things like putting people in leagues, taking people out of leagues, activating rights, uh, deactivating rights. I'm able to use MFL's modules to place information I want on those MFL pages. Uh, <laughs> I could put ads in there if I wanted to, but I, I don't. I, I'm just saying I can put anything I want in there, and right now I put – you know, your payments link, I put draft orders, stuff like that uh, into the MFL site. But I am able to automate using MFL's API and MFL's modules a whole ton of stuff that you probably couldn't with, with Flea Fick or Sleeper. I, I've talked to those guys as well to see about running some leagues there. And it's just easier with MFL with, uh, with the open API they have. Uh, I also have at League Safe. I've made it so that when someone makes a payment, I'm shot an email. I'm also I also have a page that I look at reports for knowing when people have paid, you know, and, and things like that. So all of that makes it about a thousand times easier. Uh, and this is something you probably don't know about me. It probably hasn't come up in, in most of the bios, but uh, I've been doing web development since I was 15. Okay. So, I, was, I was just going to ask you when you said you got into the APA and API or whatever, I was like, oh, so you have a, you have some sort of coding background. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I I've been doing, I've been doing web development since I was 15. In fact, there's about 15 podcasts I've set up on my server of people in the industry. I just like when people don't know how to set up a podcast, I'm like, here, I'll set it up for you. You can just do it on my server. I don't care. I won't even. Wow. Look. Yeah. I just, uh, uh, I've actually built a couple websites for people in the industry back in the day as well. But now I, I'm nowhere near good enough for what people do nowadays. There, there's some intricate stuff out there. That developer background is one of those things that's kept me in this industry, though. That the fact that I can do, you know, I can, I do this, I do national radio, I do podcasts, I do, I used to do writing and content, and I do development. I can run leagues. Like being able to be versatile is a huge key to staying staying alive in this industry for a long time. Dude, I can't emphasize that point enough. And I think it's it's so important for people 
uh, especially at the top level, if you're trying to create a real brand, I mean, listen, if, if you're just passionate about creating in, in fantasy football and you just want to write blog posts, that's cool. From where I am and I'm trying to run a legitimate like brand and business and, you know, we, we've had uh, a really successful last year and I'm like, we're trying to grow and grow and grow. And I really attribute one of the things to us being successful is that me personally, like I'm, I'm very versatile with my skill set. Like, I don't know if I'm an expert in any one thing, but mm-hmm. I can, you know, I can create a website if I need to. Like I have some HTML background and upload the podcasting and do the video editing if I need to and create right. all these things and do the graphic design and I could run Facebook ads and Instagram ads. Like, and I, I know all these things. And I think it's super important for someone at the top level to not be sucked into being really good at one thing, especially when you're starting off because you need that versatility. And most of the people that I, that I bring on to help me with it they don't know it at the start like I make sure that I I teach them these things even if it's shit that might not be relevant to them over the next you know year two years or whatever I think it's so important you get I don't know you give yourself a a really big vulnerability if you don't know how to do something within your business I think because you're either going to have to pay to outsource it and when you do outsource it like you're not really going to be able to personally tell if this person knows what they're doing right yeah the, man, you touched on something right in the middle of there, and maybe it was uh, maybe it was not intentional or intentional. But I'm a big believer of helping people out in this industry when you can. And you mentioned teaching them little things like the video editing and audio editing and whatnot, um, which are all very teachable. You can teach that teach yourself those things, and, and it just helps you in this industry. And it's awesome that you teach those people. And it's such a big thing, I think, as Oh, that, that was, and yeah, sorry, to, sorry to cut you off. That was not a, I wasn't throwing that in there to like make myself sound good. That's oh, a, no. that's a selfish thing. I'm like, you got, y'all need to know this because when I don't feel like doing it, you're going to do it for me. Like that's no, what I said. Yeah. yeah I, I didn't, I didn't know how it was coming. It didn't come off as, as arrogant or like okay. I do this. No, it's, it's just me latching on to it because I talked to, uh, I, every FSGA, I talked to, uh, um, Joe, uh, Joe at, uh, football guys, you, you know Joe Bryant, right? Joe Bryant, David Dodds, run football. I, I know the name, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I talked to Joe about that, how such a big part of this industry, as as you come up, like not only working with all these people, people, but if like you get a little bigger in the industry, you get more of a following, continue to reach down to help pull people up and help teach people how to do this business. Uh, it's it's uh, Or how to be great. And you should never look at these people. I maybe should at some points look at them as competition, but I never do. I just look at them as people I want to help and help grow the industry because I, I see this industry as is consistently growing. Like I, I see the data, I see how much it's growing. And I, it's, it's the kind of thing for me that a rising tide is going to raise all boats. I, I, I don't see us as much of competition as I should, even though I know certain companies are competition, but I, I just prefer to try to help everyone I can out if, if they, if they reach out and I'm able to, you know, put in the time to help people. It's, it's such a big deal out there. And, and that's, that's a huge lasting connection you've made. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure when Brad come on came on, he talked about uh, uh, his early work with Matthew Barry and and how that helped. And it, when when you reach down and help people out, it, you know it's it's a lifelong thing that you've created in the industry. Yeah, it, it's so easy for you to help them out, but that person on the other side is going to be forever grateful. And like you said, you know, in two years down down the road, that person might have an audience that's bigger than yours, and now they could help you out, and they're not going to forget what you did for them. So yeah, helping right. people out is it, it, it's it's. It's yeah, you don't do it because of that reason, but it's it's something that can happen. <laughs> exactly. So it's like it's it is it's like karma is a long term play. Like no matter how you look at it, like you know, another thing Gary Vee says, he's like doing the right thing is always the right thing. It always plays itself out over the long yeah, run. Right. I, yeah, I mean, I could, I'm telling you, I could pull out lines from him all day long. <laughs> Give him a listen. So talking about versatility, like you run safe leagues, and this is this is owned by this network, Sports Hub. Yep, Games Network. Network. Excuse yep. me. So they are basically the parent company to uh, a lot of these smaller niche things like Safe Leagues, uh, League Safe, MFL 10s, you said, are like best ball 10s yep. now. And they own a few uh, NFC. Regardless, they own a, a bunch of these little companies that are like niche within the within the space. I'm, I'm curious as to your involvement since I feel like content creators and influencers in the space, I hate that word, but like you're an influencer <laughs> in the space they kind of choose the path that that the industry goes down in a sense, right? Like what you push out is what the mainstream people are eventually going to latch onto and, and feel comfortable with. So mm. when we talk about versatility within the company, like you run safe leagues, but how, how much do you talk with the people that run the entire network? Like, are you, do you serve as like a consultant in a sense, because you're so in the day to day, like trenches of what fantasy football is? 
Yeah, actually, I get, I get, uh, I guess, consulted quite a bit from from the other parts of the companies just because I'm so ingrained in it. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's a very good way to put it. That I'm I'm consulted by these other places. They're going to do what they do, and they know their their specific user bases. But there, I frequently get asked, "Hey, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, is this is this something that's?" common in the in the hardcore guys is it common in the mainstream uh let, let me tell you i know it's come up on your show before but uh the mainstream the the general population is a very different crowd than, than our twitter mainstream little hardcore audience and uh that's that's something it was really hard for me to get wrapped around my head uh, once i started doing a uh, fancy football weekly which yeah. uh, i don't know if we've talked about that on this show but that's fancy football weekly is a big part of what i do too no, why don't you why don't you touch on that real quick? Uh, it's just uh, it's a uh, Fantasy Football Weekly is a weekly radio show. It's the longest running ra- fantasy football show in the in the country. It's going into year twenty six. I do that with Paul Charchian, and uh, it's it's on iHeartRadio. It's nationally syndicated in a ton of markets, but uh, that is a it's a big thing we do for like it's, it's big for marketing. We're talking about the radio station we do it on, and it's ton, on a ton. But the radio station in Minnesota. Uh, they just released the ratings and it was the number one sports radio station in the country. Like wow. this is a big sports state. Him and touched on it. Uh, Mike Wright touched on it about his live show here. And I said, I was going to bring this up, but uh, how crazy and insane that audience was and, and how this play, this state has uh, more, he said more fantasy players per capita. I, I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me because the first radio show was here, the first weekly show, the first weekly article, the first publication for fantasy football, all of those were in Minnesota. The first, uh, one of the first fantasy commissioner services, uh, commissioner products like MFL or Yahoo, et cetera, was in Minnesota. So it makes sense that there's, it's such a hotbed here. But uh, as far as the branding and marketing, having that national radio show is just huge for, for me and us. Okay. Yeah. Do you have, um, there's a couple of things I want to touch on there. Do you have, I know you said there it's like number one in, in the nation. Do you have actual numbers on, um, let's say like radio listens, if you do it like day, how many, how many days a week do you do that? Uh, we do that once a week. It's two hour show. I don't have the exact numbers. I could pull them. I just don't have that. I could probably ask charge to, to look into them. Uh, I'm just curious. Have- yeah. I'm, I'm curious because like in the way I look at it, that is awesome that it's the number one radio station sports wise in the country. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm that- sure the numbers are probably massive. I, I, I just think of if someone came to me right now and was like, Hey, we want you to do radio for like two hours a week or something like that, or like an hour a day for this week, I would uh, not that I would scoff at it, but I'd be very like Take your market <laughs> carefully. Yeah, I would. I would say like I. I think my time and energy would be better spent creating my own podcast or creating my own videos and yeah. stuff. I'm sure when you have a level, when it's a, when it's a show nationally syndicated in a bunch of major cities, like it's a different thing. Where where. Okay. Unlike, and, but I will say, you know, when people ask me to do a 15 minute spot on Kansas city ESPN, I don't know how big that market is. And I don't know how many people listen to that ESPN because there are ESPN stations that don't have a lot of audience. That's what I mean. Like, I, I think it's important for people to for understand. Minutes, I'll do it, but you tell me I have to do it weekly for an hour or two. I'd have to look into it more, you know? That, that's what I mean. It's like they throw the brand name around. It's like, yeah, like ESPN radio, but the ESPN has like 70,000 different channels. And like some of them might not be doing even as many right. numbers as a, a simple podcast that you put out. So the way I think about it is more like, I try to think more forward looking and like radio is obviously dying in a sense compared to where audio is going with podcasting and being able to listen to anything you want at any time. So I do get like a little skeptical about things like that. So it's, I mean, it's, it's cool that you guys have, have been so successful. So yeah, it's uh, the the fact is they. I mean, I guess what helps is that it's when you search fantasy football on iHeartRadio, it's it's us and the footballers are the two like the two featured podcasts. Okay, that makes like, sense. Yeah, we, we are technically their featured podcast or what? You search something like that, we're the top two podcasts that come up. So, so. it's definitely worth doing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that yeah. one is okay. worth doing. But yes, yeah. I, I get is the time worth it versus a podcast that yeah I I get. That's that. totally subjective to obviously like what you you know your personal numbers are doing on on different platforms and stuff Absolutely. like that. You mentioned that you do a little bit of the consulting work with the the company that you work under and you didn't necessarily label it as consulting work, but it's just these guys like asking your opinions yeah. and things. I yeah. think that's such a smart move because again, the content creators are the ones that are in it every day and they interact with the fans and they interact with the other creators and they're choosing which path the industry goes down. So I think for it's funny because we see more businesses and software and tech kind of pop up in this space and I'm I'm sure a lot of the consulting that they do 
is more focused on like marketing agencies. They're like, what's your, what, what's your idea of like, you know, how successful this is going to be within this space. And like, this is just, I don't know, something to those companies. I feel like it, you would be better served asking some of the creators in the space. Cause we have our, we have our hands on the pulse of what's going on here. And I, exactly. could, I feel yeah. like I could tell you what would be successful. I mean, obviously, you know, I'll be wrong about a bunch of things, but for the most part, just by being on Twitter for a day, I could be like, yeah, this will probably work. This probably won't work. Like yep. where are the people that are kind of in the trenches and, and know things like that, you know? It's, it's incredible. So yeah, no. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's incredible. Once I got in there into a bigger company like this and, and looking at that, I, it's incredible first, how slow things are to change and add certain, you know, directions that Twitter has started talking like companies tend to be a little slower to respond than you would expect. Yep. Um, and, and also a lot of times they just don't, they don't see it quick enough. They don't, they don't know it's a thing until, someone else has already hit it. So it, yeah, it's definitely good to have a type that's really plugged in like that, giving, giving advice and more companies should do that. Well, that's why you're going to see these, these, like, it's the same way that, um, you know, a lot of bigger stores over the last 10, 15 years started getting chopped down by the, these little Amazon sellers and things like that. It's like why sleeper and, and flea flicker and these smaller, um, companies that have come out like semi recently have been so successful because you have these bigger companies like the ESPNs and the yahoos that are so big. They've been so good at what they're doing for so long, but within the company, it takes a really long time to make changes. Like you want to make the, like Yahoo just made their default format half PPR, uh, like last year or two years ago for the first time. And that's something that I feel like people have played for like 10 years now. So within right. those big companies, there's just like to make one little software change could take a full year. And it's like, that's not going to get it done in our industry. That's growing and changing so rapidly. Right. So you right. make a really good point with that stuff. Even, even with safe leagues, I made the decision this year that, cause I do mostly dynasty leagues. Um, I made the decision this year. I don't think I can even open a non super flex league. Uh, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. That one QB is still a thing. I know I've watched the trend over the last five years. Super flex leagues have just exploded over the last five years. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what the data shows uh, from my polls. And uh, last year I, I filled, I filled super flex leagues. What was it? Six times faster and no, seven times faster and I filled six times more super wow. flex leagues than one QB leagues. And now we're at the point where I'm trying to fill the orphans, like teams that have been abandoned by owners. Uh, the super flex ones are gone. They're gone in an instant. I put them up, it's gone. The one QB ones, they sit a little bit. I think also the people that play Dynasty are also in that more extreme niche. Progressive. Like, yeah, so like they, I almost feel Dynasty and, and Superflex are sort of synonymous in a sense now. Like I commission all the leagues that I'm in basically, yeah. and I, I don't make any leagues that are not Superflex. So in yeah. terms of, you know, where like – fantasy football Twitter is right now. Superflex is definitely the next thing that's going to be a very mainstay of settings. But yeah, it's tough to see, as you mentioned before, like there is a huge part of the mainstream of fantasy football that's not on Twitter. So realistically, like 95% of the people that play fantasy football probably still do one quarterback league. 100% accurate. It, it, it's so frustrating to, to people like us. This is where I was going to go with that fantasy football weekly show is that I'm consistently talking to the general public and you realize you have to bring things down a little. Like right. I will all the time mention players that like people don't even know. Uh, like uh, I believe on one of your shows, Addison Hayes mentioned, I mentioned Tim Patrick and got a bunch of, who is that from yeah. that, from just that reference when everybody on Twitter knew who he was. And that's the 96 90 plus percent of public. We do a live event. We've done a live event for years and years and years here in, in Minnesota called fantasy football training camp in, in, the, in, you know, mid August. And we do a live two hour radio show. We do the radio show live. And then we do two hours of, you know, deep dive stuff and talking with fans like about thousand to fifteen hundred people come to this live event first off it's awesome wow. a live a live show in front of that many people it's just that's it's insane how, wait, how, did, how did you build how did you build it up to be that level of of capacity I, I the very first year i did it was uh four years ago i believe and it was already that big so i'm probably the wow. wrong guy to ask on that it'd probably be <laughs> okay. paul to ask on how it got that big but it, it's also as i kind of touched on the state of minnesota it's just hard it's pretty hardcore uh, but yeah, doing a live event in front of that many people is electric. But you, also you go and talk to these people and you realize very quickly that, you know, there are some really heads up people in there, but there's also a, a giant percentage of people 
they're one QB leagues. They're 16 man rosters. They, they got their redraft league, their home league. Like that's who the majority of audiences are when, mm-hmm. when I'm on Sirius XM or when I'm doing that radio show, that's who I have to, you know, cater to, but uh, you're right in the dynasty industry and in that Twitter sphere, I would say Superflex is probably still like 10% of leagues out there. Maybe I can yeah. tell you IDP is only about 10% of leagues and it has not grown in over 10 years. I was going to say, I'm the surprised. The plane has grown. The ratio has not grown. Yeah. I'm surprised when you said 10%, I was surprised that even 10% of leagues are, yeah. are IDP. And that might, yeah. Yeah. Well, that it was, that's what it was about 10 years ago. And as, as about two, three years ago, that's what it was still, um, which is pretty surprising. You know what it is? I think my main league that I'm in, the E-Town Get Down, we've been in it for like 12, this will be the 11th or 12th year or whatever. And we try to make changes basically each year. We found a really good like scoring setting that we enjoy. Okay. One year we change it to half point per, so we do, it's half point, half PPR, and we change it to a uh, half point per first down. Yes. And uh, <laughs> I know you're a big advocate from that. Pushing and, that for years. I love it. But the me, problem, the problem with that, yeah, the problem with that and with IDP, I think, and the reason it doesn't grow is just because it's not that it's not fun or it doesn't add a new element to it. The, the problem is everywhere that you go for fantasy football stuff, it, like if you go to ESPN to check the box score, they don't have any of that information. Yep. So one, how do you do proper research in order to know who to draft over someone else with these weird scoring settings. So if those things were more adapted into the mainstream of where people do their research or the mainstream of like where you just get your stats or something like that, it, that becomes a problem. Even for me, who's someone that like, I'll have no problem being able to eventually find those stats if I needed to, but it's, it, it's almost more of a hassle than right. it is outweighing the enjoyment of it, you know? And that's why we exist. That's why me and you exist. Uh, when I started doing Debbie stuff, there was nothing out there. Absolutely nothing. I had the first Debbie article. I had the first Debbie rankings. I had the first Debbie podcast. All Someone the- out there become the half point per first down guy or point yeah, per first I, down guy. I have been pushing it every year in, in Fishbowl. I, I had done an article on it before. There are other articles out there now. But if you keep pushing it, other people will latch on and they'll do stuff on it. And eventually with points per first down, if we keep pushing it and if, if the Fishbowl keeps it in, it's had it in it for three years now. If the fishbowl becomes a thing where they're like, all these big name analysts are talking about points per first down on their shows, maybe one of these days, the ESPN Game Center will have a points per first down, a first downs column. And once it's in the Game Center, then it can take off. It's not going to take off if, if guys like you and me aren't talking about it. Really, yes, I know it's hard to find information, just like it was hard to find Debbie information 13 years ago. Now it's a lot easier to find Debbie information. And if we keep pushing, if first downs get in those game centers, it's game over really. But right now we're still in that pushing stage. Dude, I really, I actually truly believe right now that there are, there are like weird, unique niche gaps within our industry that I think will be able to be exploited by some content creator. Like if someone legitimately specializes in the, the scoring settings around first downs, like you make yeah. some kind of formulas or you make some kind of stat sheets that are like, this is what it adds to a player's value, et cetera. Not just being like, this guy had this many first downs, but like taking it to a new level and incorporating it into your content, you could be known as like the first down scoring guy within the industry. Yeah. And I think there are like other niches within it that we haven't exactly exploited. And I think like I brought, um, you know, Dr. Jesse Morse of the Fantasy mm-hmm. Doctors. Yep, yep. So he came on my show. He'd come on my show once a week during the season last year. And I had him on during the summer and stuff. Actually, right before... I interviewed Andy for the first episode of this entire series two years ago. I had Dr. Jesse Morse on for his first video ever on my channel. And I was going to make that the first interview for this entire thing because I was like, this is a unique angle in order to exploit it. Like he's a doctor at the end of the day, he's a doctor and there are a million doctors within our country. But when you could take it and spin it to something that's extremely niche, like you, you get put on a pedestal for it in a sense. Those are the things you have to be thinking about i think there's like uh there's there's a space for someone to become the fantasy lawyer so when someone you know when when like someone's going through legal trouble we never have any idea what's going on like when someone's getting suspended or when someone's going through a lawsuit like fantasy twitter is just throwing out a bunch of random shit i think there could be someone that is uh really into like the weather i know we have people that cover the weather but is specific to fantasy games and how that's going to affect things you know what i mean like there are endless opportunities here i I love that you're on this angle and i will tell you there are those little people though no i shouldn't say little people there are those people, you know, just with smaller followings than they maybe should have. Uh, Ari Engel from Football Guys, FF Esquire, I believe, on Twitter. Right, lawyer, right. talks lawyer stuff when Drew Davenport, 
I, I can't remember his Twitter handle, but also uh, a lawyer. He talks, he talks lawyer stuff when that kind of stuff comes up. Uh, on the doctor front, I know Matthew Betts and Jesse Morse and uh, Dr. Chow, of course, former San Diego uh, medical guy. He's getting into the fantasy space as well. And he's, he does a weekly fantasy industry in, injury breakdown and he answers injury stuff when it happens right live on Twitter, basically. He takes a look at the video and uh, even before those, were, those guys were kind of out there, uh, Dr. Gene Brammel of Football Guys, he's one of the earliest IDP like voices out there. Uh, he he also has done doctor injury stuff. There's a couple of guys that have done weather stuff. Uh, Raymond Summerlin for Roto World used to do their weather stuff. Yeah, not not really his niche, but there's there's a, like a, a FF meteorologist type guy out there as well. I'm spacing on his name. I, right I now. see them. Yeah, I see them throughout like Twitter, <laughs> they, and I'm just like, yeah, That's... they exist out. They exist out there. They just, you know, I think you're right though. I think their followings are just going to grow and grow, especially as sports betting becomes a thing. When those things become more and more and more important uh the more sports brand gets out there guys like that are going to see their their followings and their brands and, and what they're doing become uh you know a very valuable asset I, yeah I, I mean what they do is, is valuable it's just like they they aren't getting in front of the audience right now because it's not i guess as interesting as a topic as it will be in a few years but like what i would say is th those are some of when i put out videos with dr morse like the comments on it are like this is by far the the most yeah. informational video I'll find like all week. I'm just like, I, you know, like you don't get to decide that the market does. And they're telling me, I'm like, that's the cool stuff. So like if there's someone that specializes in, in legit like weather and they reached out to me and was like, Hey Nick, like I don't want to uh, take up a lot of your time, but if you wanted me to do like one Instagram video a week where I recorded myself for three minutes, you know, long form, whatever, gave a quick breakdown on the fantasy impacts of what the weather for the weekend is going to be. Would I be able to relay that to your audience? I would be like, perfect. Take the 10,000, the 20,000, the 5,000 on Instagram or whatever that we have and do you for that. And that's how you could build your brand simultaneously. So if you're trying to come up through a very unique niche, not something that people have already been doing, but a unique niche like that, latch yourself onto someone that has uh, a big brand because, you know, that's a great value prop that they don't have to put in extra work in order to offer to their audience. So some of the best creators, I think, in a sense, if you're trying to build like a brand like I am, one of the key traits, I think, is be able to identify what your audience finds is valuable. And you don't need to be the person that delivers that value. Find people, be the middleman, because you'll still be known as, as the guy that provides really, really good value, even if it's not coming straight from your face, because you're the one who, you know, was the, the first of mind in a sense. You're the one who showed them the value. That makes sense. I love that. I love that. And it's, it's always a very, very good thing to be, you know, first to market with things early, early, uh, early to market with things. Yeah. yeah. You, you know what I mean by early to market? I'm not saying you're not necessarily monetizing. I'm saying you're one of the early ones to put it out there. Yeah, exactly. I think that's just a, a really good way for people that are creating something very unique. Now, we'd be remiss if we did not talk about all of the charity work that that you do, Scott, because you do at the end of the day, I, I want to pull up your Twitter bio because I wrote it down somewhere. And I was like, this is if, if there was a way to encapsulate who Scott Fish is like, this is it. So it says, work hard, be a good person. Everything else will follow. That is yeah, Scott's Twitter that. banner. And uh, if I had to encapsulate him into a phrase that that would absolutely be it. So if you're unfamiliar with uh, the, the work that Scott does in the charity side of things, it is unprecedented for the most part in our industry, at least. And he was named, he's been given tons of awards, right? In 2018, you were the athletic person of the year, I believe. 2019, you won the FSGA award for um, the humanitarian award. Yep. 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 Yeah. Just so last, you've done so, Vegas. so yeah, much good in our industry. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, uh, you were in Vegas, right? I was in Vegas. Okay. I came for the last night there and I, I, I linked up with a few people, but we haven't, uh, we didn't get to meet in person, unfortunately. No, but. no. Yeah. I was, I was there. I, I went to bed early that night. I had an early flight. So, uh, I was in bed by about 10 a.m. 10 PM. So. Okay. I was in bed by about 10 a.m. So we had, <laughs> so we, so we had a few uh, different night there, but uh, I want to touch on it because I think one, hopefully people out there will um, maybe contribute to what you have going on there. So give us a quick breakdown. You have, you have fantasy cares going on right now. And, and yeah. the main premise behind it is being able to provide kids around Christmas time with, uh, with toys that they might mm -hmm. not have had, had you not, you know, had your hand in this. So you have raised a, a, a really large amount of money basically through like your fantasy football following and through the Scott Fishbowl. Right. So how much did you raise this year in 2019? This year is about 60,000. Um, 60. Yeah. And we, we spread that around the country by $5,000 worth of toys here, 10,000 here, different fantasy analysts like uh, John Bosch and Ryan McDowell and Heath Cummings of CBS down in Florida. And uh, last year, like Jake Seeley and Liz Loza bought some toys. Uh, we, 
we, we spread it around the country because there are lots of different areas that, you know, <laughs> could use toys. But it was about 60,000 this year, about 130,000 total over the last uh, four or five years. That's just in- incredible. Now, when we talk about charity, has that always been like a part of who you are or did it start become more involved in the fact that like as you were growing your audience are you are you realizing more and more like oh I can make more of a difference so then it started to become you know more a part of your life and what you do from a business and a brand standpoint or was it just always something that resonated with you I could answer this about four different ways I guess uh, the way <laughs> the, where where I'll go here is I feel like I've always been this person I've always tried to help out others and I've always tried to you know be charitable whether it be with my time or, you know, do what I can with money or whatever. And about five years ago or so, uh, a guy was running a Toys for Tots drive, um, just a small one with one of the websites I worked. And uh, I helped him with it. And then he didn't do it the next year. And I kind of took it over and I turned it into Fantasy Cares. But uh, another, another part is that I'm 40 years old. And five years ago, you wouldn't tell by the look of me. I don't know if you've seen pictures of me. You can see part of me on camera. But uh, at age 35, I had a heart attack. And I am not the, my, you look at me and you don't think I'm the type of guy that would have a heart attack. I'm not, you know, overweight, like by any huge stretch or anything. Um, I, I eat and do okay. And, and at the time, I was working a manual labor job outside. Of, I've, been, I've been full-time fantasy for a good five years. But or four years, four and a half, whatever. Uh, but before that, I worked a, a, a job that had a lot of manual labor in it. And I was, you know, in decent shape, but I had a heart attack. And so I had five cardiologists trying to figure out what the heck happened to me. But I think when you have that kind of experience, uh, you start to realize everything's a little bit more precious. <laughs> and so when you do things in the back of your head, you're like, am I, am I being a good role model when I'm doing this? Is this the best version of me when I'm doing this? Are my kids watching me? And this is, you know, this is who I want to be for my kids. Is this, is this, is this the role model I want to be? So, um, I think several things were kind of a confluence right at that moment, that five years ago moment area. Uh, Everybody has their watershed moments in life. And I guess right around there is when things took a turn that I realized, and I was gaining a platform in fantasy, and I realized I can do something with my platform. You know, I can do some good. And and I started going on shows. Any podcast show I went on, any radio spot I went on, I started saying, hey, you know what? There's hundreds of thousands of fantasy leagues out there take one of your entry fees and give it to charity at the time. And, and I consistently still to this day say, doesn't have to be fancy cares, be whatever you believe in. Just give one of one of your entry fees to charity and we can do just a ton of good. Think of all the leagues out there, how much good can be done. If you just give this small little bit that you'll never miss your league will never miss it. In fact, they're probably going to be proud that their league does this. We're like, hey, we're doing this fun thing and we're helping, helping this whatever charity or project is out. And uh, I feel like adding purpose to whatever you do makes that thing better. And it's, it's also very good in a business sense. I did an FSTA panel a couple of years on this. Uh, why giving can be good why doing, you know, adding purpose to your company, adding a charitable uh, component to your company can be very good for business, especially the, uh, the younger generation wants to do what that you're more willing to give money to a company, you know, is trying to do some good out there. Right. Right. And, uh, and so if they see that you're actively have purpose in your company, it's going to do good. And it's also another talking point, another benefit. When you're listing, I sell a draft guide with this and this and, this, and oh, we give this to St. Jude's. I'm talking about the footballers here. Right. Right. Uh, it's, it's another bullet point to why to buy this draft guide or it's, you know, I, I support these fantasy analysts because they give to this charity. It's another talking point out there and it helps build that brand of yours as not just, a fantasy analyst, but also a fantasy analyst that, you know, is doing something good with its platform and you can feel good about doing, you know, supporting them. Uh, it's very, I, I feel like it's a very good business thing to, and I came about that over the last couple of years. I didn't start it there, but I realized how good it's been for just me personally to not only be able to do this, but realize that me doing this has really helped, helped me in my career as well. And, and with what I do with my businesses. That's super interesting. I think there's like a, there's an odd 
shift in, in business landscape today? Because like you said, a lot of people are, especially the younger age, we want to buy things that we, that we know are, whether it's good for the environment or we know some of the profit is going to a good cause, that would sway someone from buying a pair of jeans from company X against company Y. Right. Um, you might not think about it, right? You're like, oh, well, you know, we're going to lose some of the profit if we give it away. But in terms of volume, you make it way more back on the back end. Sure. Um, so I did want to talk, I, would, I did want to, you know, pivot this into, into a business discussion and you kind of hit on all the points that I would have, uh, that I would have asked you now. For your safe that. Leagues, <laughs> no, no, you're all good. Perfect. For your safe leagues, do you actually implement that as a rule? Do you take one of the entries or do you not want to touch people's money? Uh, we do not at the current moment. And I've, I've had discussions with my parent company about it. And we, man, if this was a couple weeks out, I would have some more to tell you about some plans we have okay. uh, as a company, but they're not completely ready to talk about publicly or, you know, push forward. Uh, things, things sometimes move slow, but we have, we have plans involving charitable components within the company, but right now safe leagues does not have that component. Okay. I was wondering, I would like to uh, get some more, more numbers on that if it does come to fruition, if you ended up getting a lot more influx from there uh, via the, the charity yeah. aspect of it. But it, I mean, it's just so, it's so real to your actual brand as a person that mm -hmm. it makes so much sense to implement that into safe yeah. leagues. So for the people out there listening, uh, where can they go to donate to Fantasy Cares? It, it is fantasycares.org because uh, fantasycares.com and dot, uh, or fan, excuse me, fantasycares.net. Fantasycares.org and fantasycares.com were taken and I have put in bids larger than I would like to admit to try to get them and I cannot get them. So it's still fantasycares.net. I we may change that. We're going to go over, I've kind of stripped down the site a little bit for now because I stopped donations at the end of the year to get all the numbers ready to do donations around and have the, you know, for, for end of year uh, numbers for my accountant and, and lawyer and whatnot. So, um, but so they're closed right now for the very moment. They'll be reopening back up uh, soonish. Uh, but we're going to go on, undergo a nice, uh, a nice web website redesign as well. Do you have a, an ETA on when they're going to open back up? I don't. It, it's normally about now, but uh, we're, we, I've been talking with uh, the, the other board members. We're, we're looking at strategic things to do with it this year, and we haven't completely fleshed it out yet. And we're, we're a little hesitant to, to open it up just until we know exactly what we want to do there. It kind of goes against what you were talking with, about with Andy. Just open it up and take, the, take those dollars right now while, while you yeah. can. It's the late, but yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's more business side. This is a little different. But uh, it, yeah, I don't know exactly when that's coming yet. It's, it should be soonish though. Okay. So let me know when it does and I will relay that to my audience and nice. um, we nice. can talk behind the scenes about somehow uh, a way that I can get involved and, you know, transfer um, hopefully some help from, from the guys over here on YouTube to yeah, love uh, that. fantasy cares. That'd be great. All right. So uh, we touched on most of the main points that I really wanted to get in with you. And we are about an hour and a half deep, which is about what I expected to get, to get into given, <laughs> uh, given the research that I did. I'm sure we could talk for hours more about, fantasy and the industry in itself. But I want to I wanna rattle off a few random questions that I like to ask my guests at the end of the interview process. I usually ask them about other creative endeavors that they could possibly see themselves doing within like five or 10 years. And I feel like you've kind of had your hand in a lot of different things. So that might take care of that. But you did say that you would like to maybe get back into being a business owner in the future. Is right. there a, a certain you know niche or industry that you're interested in doing so? Nonprofit or... Uh, I think it's both. I think it's, uh, I can see in the future, my, uh, my future business possibilities being just being my own owner of something in the fantasy community and fantasy cares, having those two businesses. Okay. Um, that that's more of what I was talking about. I'm, I, I love what I'm doing right now, but, uh, I can see opp other opportunities out there that I've, I've thought about as far as just me being the owner or co-owner of and making a run at that, uh, kind of betting on yourself, uh, <laughs> to, to have your own business. Once again, uh, outside of, outside of the, the business side though, I'm such a family guy. If anyone follows me on Twitter, they know just how mm -hmm. family oriented I am. It's, it's a very big deal to me. Uh, I can, I can see, I can see even taking a slight step back from, from uh, some of the fan, like not doing quite as many fantasy things. And that's part of being your own, you, my own owner is, you know, focusing on one thing instead of all the things I'm currently doing. 
um, and, and taking a little step back and, and spending a little more time with family. And, and as my, as my kids play more sports, maybe coaching sports and stuff, I guess, I guess that's, that's about the only other arena outside of fantasy I can even think of. Yeah. The family theme seems to be a, a constant thing from the people I have on the show because they are people with families and I am not. So when I think about the question, you know, I think about it from a very different angle, but I mean, yeah, yeah. it totally makes sense given, given the stuff that you tweet out and, and how involved you are with uh, you know, your business the charity and the family. So um, that that's incredible. So I want to, I want to hit you with two final questions. One that I saw from Tim Ferriss in tools, of Titans, best purchase you've made under $100. This one's extremely easy for me because it's probably my favorite purchase I've ever made in my life. And everyone's going to think it's stupid. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, I have a pair of Carhartt mittens. I live in Minnesota and these Carhartt mittens, and I should almost tweet it out or, or something because they are the most amazing gloves mittens I've ever seen in my entire life and they've lasted for several years and everybody I tell about these mittens that gets them just they rave about them they're what's what's they're, the name of the company car hartman's car heart oh did you say Carhartt mittens is that what you said yeah yeah oh, I didn't hear the I heard like the mittens kind of intertwine with the word like car hartman's that's no, it. Okay, I guess it was no. the accent kind of got me there Carhartt is the name of the company and it, they're just uh, this pair of mittens that's there they're durable and they're warm and they're so soft on the inside and they last forever and they're just like the best things ever I can't go through winter without them they're they're just absolutely amazing <laughs> yeah I don't think that's stupid at all coming from someone in Minnesota so I'm not that's I'm not about it. to knock you for that yeah that's all right Right, last, last and final question. We need one bold prediction. One bold prediction of the fantasy football industry as a whole. It could be one years down the road, two, five, ten, whatever it is. Give me a bold prediction for the industry as a whole. Man, my, my bold prediction is, wouldn't be bold. It'd be that Superflex is going to become the new standard, much like PPR did. And PPR is going to start to die, die off to have PPR or even something else. I guess that's that would be part one. The other one would probably be some of the games out there would become a little more simplistic. Uh, people love the uniqueness. The, the, I, I specialize in unique, fun, interesting leagues, and those will always have their, always have their, uh, their market out there. But things like the, the guillotine leagues that Paul Charchin is doing where you know, it's, it's a season long league, but the lowest score gets cut every week. Their players go to waivers. You, it's a very simple twist on a simple format, or maybe a DFS game where there's no salaries. You just pick who you want. Uh, sharks won't love it as much, but your general basic common player would eat that up. Like not common DFS player, but the players that aren't playing the 90% that aren't playing DFS right now would probably eat up a system like that where, Hey, I can just pick my five or six guys and just shoot root for those guys this uh more simplistic broad-based games which i think is what best ball was more a fun simple, less work yeah a more fun less work i can do more of these type of style games i think those are going to become a lot more popular yeah i'd agree with that I, th I think as it keeps expanding we'll see more like niche games like that kind of pop up and serve everybody deep down to their core like what what exactly they want to be playing we'll keep seeing more things pop up that way yeah. all right that will wrap up this episode of behind the business of fantasy football make sure that you are following scott fish his twitter has been probably sitting right below him this entire <laughs> interview is there anything else you got going on that you would like to uh link to the people other than your twitter and, and fantasy cares I don't think so, man. We covered so much ground. I don't think there's anything that uh, we didn't cover at this time. I, I think if I had one recommendation to people out there who are, uh, who are trying to break in or, or are starting to break in, I cannot stress consistency more than anything. Um, well, first off, be yourself, which you talk about on this show all the time. You have to be yourself. But the, most of the things I've done in this industry have done very well. Um, the few things that did not do well were be completely on me and because I wasn't consistent with them. And uh, <laughs> if that's taught me anything, you need to be really consistent, either not just with consistently producing content, but also consistent with your message. Uh, both of those two things, huge deal out there for, for people who want to stay around. Yeah. One thing I've learned over the long run at this point is that talent 
but outside of like very few things like being a basketball player, a football player, something that's not physical talent is, is so far overrated compared to hard work and consistency. I'm serious. Right. As, as cliche as that sounds yeah. like anybody who is successful will tell you that they're not really that talented. You know, it, it's just the amount of work and consistency that they put in. Like, sure. There are people that will reach the ends of the spectrum on a talent level, but everyone has that same common denominator of consistency and hard work. Yeah. Very true. Very true. So we will leave y'all with that. All we ask is that if you found this interview to be uh, valuable informational that you share with other people that might do the same, hit that thumbs up button. If you enjoyed, subscribe to the channel. If you are new, I'm not sure who's going to be on next week, but I'm sure it'll be someone that is fantastic. And uh, Scott Fish, thank you so much for coming on for this week. Oh, thank you for having me, man. This is great. Later, guys. Hey, hey, hey.